where people live, how they live, how they're affected by the criminal justice system, how they are educated, the resources that are available to these schools, the programs that that try to benefit people in the society are disproportionately uh, skewed. All of these uh, things lead to a society that is still riven by unfairness and discrimination. And one has to recognize that the affirmative action is a means of trying to correct for that racial injustice. That's what we have not been able to talk about. Good morning, this is Epicenter NYC. We connect our communities to news, information, and each other. I'm Andrea Pineda Salgado. In June of this year, the Supreme Court is expected to roll back affirmative action, a decision that would devalue the diversity that defines our schools, workplaces, institutions, and communities. Among those taking a stand in support of affirmative action is Lee Bollinger. Bollinger is a current president of Columbia University. Before that, he was a president of the University of Michigan. Throughout his career, he's fought for the use of racial preferences to promote diversity, perhaps most notably with his role in Grutter v. Bollinger, a 2003 Supreme Court decision that's at risk of being overturned. Still, Bollinger is continuing to push for race-based admissions with his new book, A Legacy of Discrimination, The Essential Constitutionality of Affirmative Action, co-authored with Jeffrey Stone. Today, Epicenter's Mitra Kalita talks to Bollinger about the book and what he sees as the biggest challenges ahead. I want to congratulate you. I also want to acknowledge that the book comes as you're um, leaving your role at Columbia. And so I might come back to kind of some broader career lessons, but if we could focus on the need for a book like this at a time like this, I wonder if we kind of start with the big and then I have some specific questions about how you um, framed this as as a case, if you will? I think the answer uh, is, in one sense, completely straightforward. There are, are two cases in the Supreme Court right now, Harvard and the University of North Carolina. And they pose a question that has been really uh, in American society since the 1970s. And that is, is it constitutional? and consistent with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for selective universities uh, and colleges to consider race and ethnicity as a factor in accepting students for their student body. That's the immediate question before the Supreme Court. It is also the case that it looks like the Supreme Court will either answer no to that or that it continues to be constitutional, but the demands on universities to prove uh, that this uh, satisfies the court, that it will be so burdensome on colleges that the effective answer will be no. And if that is the outcome, it will reverse a half century of efforts by higher education to try to uh, become more diverse and it will have profound effects on the society broadly, in law, in journalism, in business, uh, in the military, uh, because the affirmative action in higher education for the past 50 years has been enormously successful in helping to integrate this society. So there's a question before the Supreme Court. That's what the question is. It is immensely significant, but it's also a moment Uh, in history where many of the major principles and doctrines and decisions of the Warren Court era, it looks as if the court is on a path to reverse many of those uh, decisions. We know most famously now that the court did that with Roe versus Wade. So this case seems to be the one before us on affirmative action, one of several where the constitutional where constitutional law as created a half century ago by the supreme court is about to be reversed so there's a second layer of importance i think the third layer of importance is that the united states is struggling to understand what it means to live in a society that is fair 
and equal and free of invidious discrimination against groups of people. Uh, so I'll tell you, I, I entered journalism when I was 16 years old through a minorities journalism workshop. I am brought back every year to speak to the organization. And about 15 years ago, you you probably know the math better than me. I started to see white students in the seminar. It was the summer, like two week program. And I said, what's happening? And they said, the Michigan case, um, we don't want anyone to take us to court. And so a number of minority focused programs around the country, and they kind of rattled them off, are getting out in front of this. And that's how it's been for the last 15 years. Now, I would, there's a part of me that wonders what is the difference now that it's actually going to be called out explicitly as opposed to this kind of in between system we had. Yes. So, <clears throat> as you know, of course, I was uh, a defendant <laughs> in the Michigan cases. And I was also, I led the, the litigation as uh, president of the University of Michigan at the time. And that was the first time a majority of the Supreme Court, five to four, ruled in favor of higher education taking race into account as a factor in admissions for educational purposes. That was the first time that the court solidly uh, declared that principle uh, under the 14th Amendment. However, the opponents of affirmative action are, if anything, dogged and determined to continue litigating that question and have done so year after year. And now with these two cases before the Supreme Court, I think many lawyers over the course of that 20-year period have said to their clients, even though you have a solid decision uh, you have to be careful because the uh, the willingness of people to sue, some people to sue, uh, and to keep pressing to raise the question over and over again, is constant. So I, I think your your general point is the right one. That is, there is a there is a nervousness and anxiety uh, that exists in the society that you will be sued if you if you seem to be favoring uh, underrepresented minorities. The irony is, of course, um, the workplace that college graduates will enter, which seems to value diversity. And while, you know, there's a backlash in that regard as well, and certainly with CRT in the workplace beyond education, I mean, you could say there's a, there's a backlash to diversity in the workplace, and yet... Most major corporations have come out and said this is a value, right? And I just wonder how you reconcile that climate that we seem to be in with what might happen in the court. I think it's fair to say the society is deeply divided on this issue. You know, the, the numbers are always seemingly striking. You know, 60 plus percent of Americans polled. Do you think it's fair to take race or ethnicity into account? The answer uh, is overwhelmingly no. So my view is always, I don't think you can think about this problem through polls uh, because it only is a very complex matter. You can only illuminate it through conversation and discussion, going back to the civil rights era, back to slavery, back to Jim Crow laws onto the present and the current forms of discrimination. I mean, it's only by steeping yourself in that kind of discussion can you then really say what your view about, about racial and ethnic diversity. However, it is the case that various states, nine in particular, have said have outlawed, banned affirmative action within their states. It is the case that um, that activist groups are constantly uh, suing uh, institutions and individuals, as is true in the cases now before the Supreme Court. It is absolutely true that there is vigorous opposition uh, to affirmative action and vocal and and put in terms that are somewhat frightening, frankly. So there is a deep, uh, a deep controversy. There, there's no question about it. And I just wanted to get to some aspects of the book. You rely on Brown versus Board of Ed um, quite a bit. It, it's so clear the kind of the role of education and its ability to change. Uh, the fortunes of families. I, I have like a two-part question on that. One, do you feel like 
there's a lot of pressure on education to solve society's ills. The second piece is on Brown versus Board of Ed itself is, is there a universe where the Supreme Court outlawing affirmative action threatens Brown versus Board of Education and what we, I thought, regard as somewhat sacred in this country, that separate is not equal. Jeff Stone and I wrote this book because we felt that not only is affirmative action constitutional, it is extremely successful, has been extremely successful in helping to realize the ideals of Brown versus Board of Education. I'll come back to that. So we want to defend affirmative action as constitutional, as legal, against the attacks that are now and previously been leveled against it. But we also wanted to change the discussion because in an anomalous moment in constitutional history, there was one justice, Justice Lewis Powell, who in the Bakke case in the late 70s said that affirmative action for educational diversity was okay under the Constitution, but affirmative action as a means of correcting, remedying past and present injustices because of invidious discrimination against African Americans, uh, Latino, Native Americans, was not constitutional. And ever since then, the discussion within higher education about affirmative action has been blunted by the inability to be able to talk about the reality of discrimination in slavery, Jim Crow, and even up to the present day. And the need for institutions, especially higher education, especially education, to try to correct for that. So, so that was the primary purpose of the book, defend affirmative action, but, but let's change the debate to something that's real here and encompassing of a reality that any sane person would understand to be the case. And your second question was, is there some risk that Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, certainly the greatest decision of the Supreme Court of the 20th century, one of the greatest of our entire history with re Republican and Democrat appointed justices, unanimously holding that segregation of African Americans from uh, white schools, separate but equal as a doctrine of the Constitution, would no longer stand. We are still in a world in which there is still massive segregation in K-12, through public schooling all across the United States, in many areas as severe and disabling to young students as it was in 1960 or even 1950. It's a reason why affirmative action is still necessary in higher education, but it's also a reason why the ideals of Brown should be reinvigorated and brought to bear on the public school system, on the housing system, on the criminal law system, and so on. So what I would say that's important to know is that Brown was a great decision. It reoriented American society towards our ideals of fair and equal citizenry. But we have not come close. We have improved, but we have not come close to meeting those ideals. And in fundamental ways, where people live, how they live, how they're affected by the criminal justice system, how they are educated, the resources that are available to these schools, the programs that, that try to benefit people in the society are disproportionately uh, skewed. All of these things lead to a society that is still riven by unfairness and discrimination. And one has to recognize that the affirmative action is a means of trying to correct for that racial injustice. That's not that's what we have not been able to talk about. Mm, and and that's why I, this gets to my next question about you said we should not be a, apologetic for this. And yet there is an undercurrent of I, I just got one kid into college last year. So I was on a million lists 
And it's very common for families to say, oh, you know, my white kid has no chance at insert whatever, or in the workplace, I'm a white guy. I have no chance at X, Y, Z. I just wonder how you reconcile the, we should not apologize. And yet this language that's almost, um, it's kind of like after the fact, like we know what the outcome is going to be. And yet it's so insulting in the process. So how do you, how do you reconcile that? Well, I think one of the ways in which people who oppose affirmative action have tried to build opposition is by making whites feel as if they are giving up opportunities for others who don't deserve it. And one of the things about the civil rights movement was the opposing perspective, which is to say, you believe that people should um, have equal opportunities to succeed in the society. If you believe that, and I think almost everybody or most people do, then you have to look at what is happening to particular groups who are faced with a completely unequal playing field in which to compete. And so institutions, the society, et cetera, need to take actions to correct for that so that real opportunity, equal opportunity can be available. My last question is just as you're leaving Columbia. So you announced that you're um, stepping down in June of this year. Affirmative action is such a part of your legacy. It's literally its own section on Wikipedia. It'll forever be um, a part of your legacy. So I just wanted you to reflect on that. And, you know, for the last few years, I think even people who have been working within issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion have felt a difference. And as you're going out, we're talking about the Supreme Court potentially right. reversing your legacy. And so I, I just I just want you to reflect on that a little bit. Yes. So um, it, there is a, a sort of a, a bracketing. I mean, I came in as as president of the University of Michigan, 1997. Immediately, the university was sued over affirmative action. I knew the case would probably make it to the Supreme Court. It was critical to defend it. Uh, and then I come to Columbia, and the court comes down shortly after that with the major decision holding affirmative action constitutional. And now I'm ending my career as a university president some 26 years later with the prospect that it will be severely cut back or possibly even overruled. And it's stunning. And it just, I think it tells you that you can't count on anything. You you just cannot um, assume that the the world will get better and better. Your society will get better and better. Uh, it it requires constant effort. Um, so it, this is a this is an ongoing battle, an ongoing effort, and you really can't take it for granted that it will work out. While the ongoing debate over affirmative action will be waged primarily in the courts, there are still ways we can act. First, we need to continue to remember that Black Americans especially endured a shameful legacy of discrimination that denied equal opportunity for centuries. It's a legacy that hasn't been undone. Second, we need to increase access. As Bollinger says, we must make room in the classroom and at the conference table for non-traditional voices, for people who have been historically denied access. Our leading institutions will only become more relevant, vibrant, and resilient. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. And thanks for supporting us as we do our best to support our community. We couldn't do it without you. For more stories like this, visit us at epicenter-nyc.com. And if you're not already a member, sign up today by using the link in our show notes. Our intro music is All the Pretty Horses by Karavika. You can find more of their music on their website linked to in our podcast description.